Next week, by the way, so we're you know finishing up our little mini series here of uh, being anxious for nothing, and then uh, uh, next week we we jump back into Acts, and we're going to be in Acts 18. So I know like almost all of you are going to be like, oh good, thank you for letting me know because you're going to start reading ahead this week on that. And but here's what it's about: discouragement. Uh, discouragement. Uh, is how I'll be if you don't read Acts 18. No, um, uh, discouragement to encouragement. So that's what Acts 18 is going to be addressing, and I'm looking forward to diving in that with you. But, you know, as we are here in the book of Philippians, I have my Bible open to Philippians chapter 4, uh, and I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles as well to Philippians chapter 4, uh, and we're going to be looking at verses 4, and I'll read through verse 9, uh, and... As you're turning there, or if you're using our church app, by the way, right, if you're online, uh, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little icon down there, Uh, and the reason why that pops up there is because there's a verse that's mentioned. You can click on that little tab there, and it's going to pop up in your app there right to that verse. So so if you're like, I don't know where to find, uh, is this about from the Philippines, or what is this about? No, it's the book of Philippians, and it's going to pop right there. It's easy for you to find. So... Why don't I pray and ask God to guide us through his word this morning. Lord God, we, uh, we come, as, as we have been, uh, asking and, and really just pleading with you, Lord, to, to stir and to move in us. Lord, we've been reminded that you are indeed good, perfect in every way, and you are good to us. So Lord, help us to to wrap our minds around your word this morning so that we know not just what it says, but how does it live out in our lives. God, I know that uh, there's a room full of anxious, laden people. So help us to, to hear from your spirit and make the changes that are needed as we apply your word into our lives. So we ask this in your great name, what a wonderful, what a beautiful name it is, in Jesus' name, amen. So here we are, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, uh, kind of been studying here from verses 4 through 8, and so uh, let, me, let me read this for us again so we have the context of where we're heading this morning. We've been in this, this is the fourth week now, we're finalizing this part of, of the little mini-series here on anxiousness and how to be anxious for nothing. And this morning, what's going to happen when we go to read this, uh, I, I know, I, in fact, I was talking with James earlier today, and he's like, man, you're looking forward to that? I'm like, so looking forward to it, because this, this is the missing link piece. Today, when you leave here, you will never deal with anxiety again uh, because of this piece. So I'm so glad... You, uh, you're here with us this morning. Uh, it is, well, that was a far um, stretch of the truth. Uh, so whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Uh, but here's what we do have. Great application because God wants you to experience his peace. And God has made it crystal clear. How do we do that? And how do we fight for joy day in, day out? Here's where, here's where we're going to land So look with me, follow along with me in Philippians chapter 4 and following. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. So, so we've been here, right? So the last three weeks, right? The first week, remember, we started here in verse 4. Rejoice 
And it was super important. Here's the first step to a cure for the anxious, worry-laden heart. The first step is rejoicing in the Lord always. Right? So we're going to be looking to him. So this is the very first step. We jump right into it uh, on the beginning of the year of rejoicing in the Lord. Because when we're worried and we're anxious, typically what's not on top of our mind is God. So we're going to rejoice in him because we know who God is. That God is faithful. He's just. He's going to be working. He is in control. Which also brought us right into the next week, right? Of your reasonableness be known to everyone. You don't have to be anxious about anything. Because, remember that little important thing, that little phrase in there? The Lord is at hand. God is at hand. Meaning, he doesn't, he doesn't hide when he hears your voice. Oh, God, I need you. Oh, not again. You? Can one of the angels, you know, step in here and, and help? Because I'm so tired of this person. That's not what God does. God is at hand. He is available for you. So we call on him. And how do we do that? Through prayer, supplication, make your request be made known to God. That's like, right, God? It's like Paul was saying here, Paul, the author, the apostle, he's like, pray, pray, pray. Like it's a command to pray with thanksgiving. Important element there. Thanksgiving, because we know that God's in control. He's going he's gonna to do what he needs to do to accomplish his purposes. And he's free to do that through me. So, Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is at hand. And then last week we looked at the peace of God. And what we discovered last week was the fact that God's peace is yours for the taking. It's available to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Any child of his, his peace is available for you. And it surpasses understanding. It, it, it's mind-blowing. And I'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we've already been, been like loaded with all kinds of incredible truths about how do we fight for joy and how do we fight and kill anxiety, right? And so this morning, when we come to this final piece here, it's where Paul says, finally, brothers, and he's going to give six adjectives of, of how do I deal with this daily? You're going to leave here, and this week, you're going to have to apply this verse into your life, maybe even a day. So he gives us a, a filter of, of, of all that we put in and all that we think on and dwell on. He gives us a filter. This is what you want to think on if you're going to experience the peace of God. So there's a couple of things that I want you to be able to get in here uh, that we're about ready to unpack as, as we go through here. Is that, one, how incredibly freeing this is. So we can look at this and just as a, this list of like, check, 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 check. Okay, I did it. Good. And you can maybe leave here thinking, man, it's kind of restrictive a little bit. It's just a big checklist of like, I have to do all of these things. Or, and this has been my prayer, so you're going to find this incredibly freeing of all the things you get to think on and dwell on, as opposed to the worry and anxiety and all the other junk that we tend to dwell on. And then practically, just how does this work? How does it practically work? And, uh, and so we get, to, we get to see this. So look again with me at Philippians 4.8. And this is the verse that we're going to unpack this morning. Uh, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, and here it is. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, and if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. These are the things to think on. I'll come back to that in a minute. It, there's, there's no question, if you were to be reading through the Bible here, that what you think on is what you become. It's really important what we think on. Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What you think on, so you are. We're a product of what we think on. And that's what Paul's going to be addressing and getting on in our hearts here this morning. What you think on is what you become. This week, what you set your sail at is the direction you're going to head. It's important. So out of this, we have here hope, 
It's a hope-filled verse of killing anxiety and experiencing the peace of God. Personally, um, not only am I, I'm incredibly thankful for this verse. I, I thought it'd maybe be important for you to know, like, I love this verse and this passage. This verse, this passage, the Spirit of God has brought to my mind innumerable times, and it has been the markings in my thinking pattern that leads me to the peace of God. When, when God brings these things to mind and I stop in what I'm dwelling on and the, the anxiousness and the worry that I'm starting, it wells up inside of my, my heart and I'm just getting weighed down and thinking. Uh, and, and that's at any time, I mean, middle of night, this is day, all, whenever this, the Spirit of God will often bring this to mind, this passage, this verse. And when I start to think, stop to think on these things, they're the markings that lead me to experiencing the peace of God. Uh, so I, I use this, and, and often it's coupled with 2 Corinthians 10.5 that says, take every thought captive to obey Christ. So if you were to take 2 Corinthians 10.5 of take every thought captive to obey Christ. I'm going to take this thought. I want to obey Christ. Coupled with this, awesome. You got something going, going on here. So this is, uh, I love this passage. I love this verse. It's the filter that I want to apply into all of my thinking and, and my, all of my inputs uh, that are going on. It affects every area of my life, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm excited about this. So let's do a quick inventory, all right? A quick inventory of the six adjectives, the six things that Paul says, hey, think on these things. Here's the first one, right? So whatever is true, whatever is true, whatever is honest, what's sincere, uh, is, uh, there's no lies, there's no rumors, no exaggerations of the truth. I'm going to think on what is true, what, what's really going on here. So obviously, that's going to include all of God's word. God's word is true. We have his word and it is true. It is inerrant. We can trust what God has said and God is trustworthy. So I'm going to think on the things of God. So whatever is true, when, when I'm weighed down, I begin to question what I'm thinking on. Is this true? Personally, how I apply that. Is this true? I want to think on what's true, right? Check. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is honorable, things that are worthy of respect. Uh, this is uh, something that is uh, noble, Maybe your translation even says whatever is noble. This is noble. Uh, this is uh, things that I want to think on that are honorable. So whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. And another word for just here, like what, things that are just, things that are right. You can even use the word righteous. Things that are right. I'm going to think on things that are going to bring about me doing what is right. Right actions. Just actions, fairness, righteousness. You getting that? Right? So whatever's true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. So all of a sudden, those things that we're thinking on, I'm going to put them through those filters. Is this true? Is this honorable? Is this just? So halfway there, all right? Whatever is pure. Oh, is it pure? What, what does pure mean? What do you think pure means? Somebody? Anybody? Besides? What? What did you say? Fair, clean. Good. God bless you. Thank you. Yes. So sometimes we tend to think of pure as like just morally, well, it does mean morally pure, morally clean. We tend to just attach that with sexual purity. It certainly includes sexual purity. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But it's it's, more, it, it's much broader than that. It's moral purity. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure. Things that are free from sin. 
uh, things that, um, that, that are not tainted with evilness, pure. So uh, some things that come to my mind that, that might, you might find helpful uh, in this, of, of purity. Uh, guys, if you're struggling with pornography, dealing with lust, Job 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes to not look lustfully at a young woman. Oh, that'd be a good one, wouldn't it? Maybe you want to stick that up by your screen. Job 31.1. But take a look at this, next, this verse here. Uh, Psalm 101, uh, the second part of verse 2 and 3. I will live with a heart of integrity in my house. I will not let anything worthless guide me. I hate the practice of transgression or sin. I hate the practice of sin. It will not cling to me. It's not going to cling to me. So hold that for a second. I want you to think on that. Now, where could you put that up in your house? <laughs> Can you see putting that up somewhere? What about just writing it on your heart? I will not, I will live with a heart of integrity in my house. How's your house? What are the things that you see on your screens? How's your conversations with those in your house? I'm going to live with integrity. How how do you treat your finances? I'm going to live with integrity. I'm not going to let anything worthless guide me. Man, this is rich. (laughs) So, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure. And fifthly, whatever is lovely. Um, What is this lovely? Things that are pleasing and satisfying to God. The things that he's created. So from a a sunrise and sunset to the, the majesty of his creation to a symphony to caring for the needs of others. All things beautiful. That's what this is. I'm going to think on all things that are lovely, all things that are beautiful. I'm going to dwell on those things. And then lastly, whatever is commendable, uh, highly regarded, uh, things that are, um, that where, where somebody does something and people sit and go, man, they applaud that kind of a thing. Admirable. Is this admirable? Dwell on these things. So Paul says, think on these six things, right? And then he closes up, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. In other words, this is the kind of thing that God wants you to let your mind be filled with. Fill your mind with these kind of things is what he's directing here. If you want to experience the peace of God, it's going to take a constant, regular filter of thinking through these kind of things. Uh, think, think about or think on these things is the Greek word uh, logizomai. We get the word logic from. So turn it over and over in your mind. Think on, uh, consider, or dwell on. I want you to think on this. Not just like a, oh, yep, okay, good, check, and move on. Think on these things. Uh, the idea here being, uh, Patrick, you're a math major. Uh, you think of these great, huge, uh, massive, mathematical equations, like probably most everybody does. And so, so all of those math equations, you have to think through those things. There's logic involved with that. You have to consider all the ins and outs of all of those things, right? That's the idea here. Think on these things. Think about this. Dwell on this. Work it. You almost get the idea of like there's a, a habit of discipline of thinking on these things. Did you get that? And I, and I I find this incredibly freeing. 
my mind has a tendency to run ragged sometimes. It just runs all over the place in my thoughts. This is what I find is uh, grounding. It's my footing for what I think on. Those thoughts that I take captive and place them to, under Christ to obey him. I, I take that thought. I'm like, wait, hold on. I want to obey Christ in this. Is this true, honorable, just, pure, lovely? Right? I think on these things. Innumerable times it's what God has used to, to bring about peace of mind. Because it's a, it's a battle. So what I'm wrestling with mentally, the thing that I'm anxious over or that I'm tempted with when there's temptations, I'll, I'll take this verse and I'll hold it up to the light and it's like a diamond that has all the different uh, shapes and markings on there and all the angles and I look at this in light of this, to consider what's true and honorable and right and just and pure and lovely and of good repute. It's remarkable what I discover in my thinking when this is the filter. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. So, right, we, we want to be practical. Uh, so I want to experience the peace of God. I know that's what you want. You want to experience the peace of God. Like, man, how do I experience the peace of God? I got all this anxiety. I got all these different things I'm worried about. So it, you got to grab a hold of it. It's like you are, uh, the, you are the air traffic controller of your mind. There's all kinds of things that swirl around, and you're the one that allows things to land or take off. You're the air traffic controller. So what is it you're not allowed to land? What are you going to allow to take off? And all those thoughts that go on. Let me give you an example. A little while ago, I had this little bump just right here. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I wonder what that is. Kind of left it, no big deal. Seemed to maybe get a little bit bigger. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I should get that checked out. So I'm at the doctor's. I'm like, hey, this little bump here. I'm like, yeah, you should probably get that checked out. I'm like, well, is it? they're like, oh, it's probably a cyst. I'm like, that's something I should be worried about? They're like, oh, probably not. But you probably want to get it just checked out, taken care of. Okay. So, as any good person does, I'm like, phew, all right, good. Make an appointment, dermatologist, get it taken care of. Before I get to the dermatologist, I go to what everybody should go to, WebMD. And uh, just so you know, uh, if you didn't know this already, the list on anything, anything that you search, somewhere in that list, they're going to put the word cancer, just so you know, right? And it's like, so there's a cyst, and I'm like, cyst, and they're like, oh, cancer. And it's like way down near the bottom, possible cancer. You're like, oh, I might have cancer. And I started, my mind's starting to run crazy now, right? You're like, oh, man, what does that mean? And what's going to happen? And, uh, and, uh, and and all of a sudden, it's like, God brings this to mind. Like, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Is this true? Well, yes, it is true. Wait, wait, wait. I don't know it's true. What I do know is that God's true and that God's in control. And I'm going to, also, I had to take that thought captive and I had to put it under the filter of this. And here's where I landed. God's in control. And here, okay, one little side note. Here's what keeps this from being just good, positive thinking. And this is not a message about let's just think good thoughts, good vibes for everybody, and we're all going to be good. That's ridiculous. Uh, that is, um, yeah. Uh, here's what makes this God-glorifying and a path to experience the peace of God and not just good, warm, fuzzy feelings. Because I might have cancer, but I know that God is going to bring about his best because he's in control, he's my creator, and I know I can trust him. And I want him to be honored and glorified in whatever happens. 
totally different than just, well, I just know everything's going to be okay. I don't know that. From my perspective, it may not, but from God's perspective, when I take that thought captive and place it under Christ, absolutely it's right, because God's perfect. And God's going to accomplish his purposes, and I want nothing more than to experience his peace as I walk with him. And if I need to go through whatever I need to go through so that I can do that, then so be it. Right? That's taking this thought captive. But man, that is easier said than done. And if you have like, maybe if you have teenagers that are driving, or some of you are, you're right on the cusp or you will soon. <laughs> Child's not home yet, supposed to be home, running late. Your mind just starts running. Well, this is, yeah, um, it does for me. You're like, oh, what if they got an accident? Who are they with? What's going on? What are they doing? Right? All these things, like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, man, you start going crazy. Maybe, maybe you're in a place, you're like, man, we're never going to get out of the hole of finances. I can't believe we did this. And you just start digging yourself in mentally into this massive hole. And then what you do is once you dig the hole, you drop yourself in it, and you start shoveling the dirt on top of yourself, right? Just burying yourself in it. We're not going to get through this. I don't know how we're not going to get through this. He's got a big hole. What if I were to put these things through this? There's a million thoughts that all of a sudden your mind goes in a, right over the edge. So this is not just a one-time deal. This is something that's an ongoing, regular application of God's word. This is the verse that's going to get footing. This is, it's almost as though it's like Ephesians 6.14, put on the belt of truth. It's almost like that's what you'd be doing if you were to be thinking on these things. I mean, doesn't this passage, doesn't this verse and this passage have, sound somewhat like the aim of what Isaiah 26.3 says? Take a look at this verse. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's this, isn't it? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I want that. I want my mind to stay on you. That, this is it. This is the application. This verse in Philippians is what grounds us. And, and, and it's not just for, well, you're the pastor, of course. That's for you. No. It's not for just pastors or just for mature or just for super saints. This is to be applied by anybody who calls on the name of the Lord. All of us. Everybody. Everybody. So I want you to think on this. Dwell on this for a second. This was written for you. This was written for you to apply into your life. It's intended for you to apply it, intended for you to live it out this week. And it means there actually has to be application of it in our lives. Saying yes to some things, to things like this, and saying no to others. It will take effort. Uh, There isn't a week that when we open up God's word and we look to apply God's word, that there's like a magic pill that all of a sudden, well, if I just read it, I'm good. I came to church. I'm good. I'm covered now. There's, there's no magic dust that I can spread over you, and all of a sudden, we got it now. No more anxiety. Woo. I got to get back next Sunday so I can get that little dust put on me again to cover me. No, no, no. This is intended to be applied constantly. When you leave here this afternoon, when you're starting to think about tomorrow and what you got to go back to tomorrow, or your kid starts throwing up tonight at 2 a.m. 
Yeah, you're going to have to apply this. I can guarantee you. <laughs> you constantly have to wrestle with this. You have to bring it before the Lord. Again, it's, it's like Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the application of this. Because what we think on is what we become. We become what we think on. What you dwell on is what you become. So what are you going to think on? What is it that you dwell on regularly? What do you... What do you what do you allow to circle around your minds and allow to land? And, and we don't, so again, right, real, just real practically. How does this, the filter, so if, if these are the, the markings for me on my path that I'm going to experience the peace of God, these are the markings here that I apply this whole passage and or this verse Boom, 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 here they are. If I'm going to apply that into my life, what does that mean of what I'm putting into my mind? What is it I'm going to dwell on? What is it I'm going to think on? What are the things that I'm seeing in my life that I'm like, nah, I'm not. Does it need to be brought under these kind of things? Examples. We have a friend that was finding it very difficult to sleep at night. So do you know what they would read before they go to sleep? Murder mysteries. Okay, you want to read a murder mystery? Fine, maybe. But would it be more helpful to read a murder mystery or something like Jerry Bridges' Transforming Grace? Which one's more fun? Well, in some ways, maybe the murder mystery, but what's going to be helpful for your heart that's going to have long-term effects? A friend of ours, their teenager, waking up, having nightmares. Do you know what they would watch before they go to sleep? Horror movies. And they're waking up having nightmares. I just don't understand. She keeps waking up having nightmares. Would it be more helpful to fill your mind with something that filters through this or something that is like Saw 3, you know? No wonder you're having nightmares. I want to stop for a sec. I want to put this through the filter of Philippians 4.8. Let's get even more personal. You're probably not watching horror movies. You're like, that's not me. How about this? Are you constantly discontent? You just you have a regular thread of thought that's underlined that you're like, man, I just feel discontent. I'm just never really happy, just discontent. You know what I often find? Those that are often discontent and can't recognize the goodness of God in your life, of how he's provided for you. I find that, and here's neutral, probably, a neutral thing. A constant stream of HGTV. Wow, he's really attacking HGTV? No, I'm not attacking it. It's relatively neutral. But if you have a constant diet of HGTV, plan on having a lot of discontentment. Because it just forms and you're like, oh, I want that. We don't have to do that. I, I don't have that. It just forms that. Constantly, you're just like, man, I'm just disappointed in my relationships. I just can't have a right relationship. Things aren't going right in it. And you're just wondering about your relationships, but you have a diet of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Maybe you want to filter Philippians 4.8 through that. Maybe you find yourself just regularly fearful, edgy. Or maybe you're growing in your arrogance of like being in the know. And you also have a constant stream of news. Got to be in the know. So you start to grow this idea of like, 
well, I know it, I'm in the know, I can have these, you know, I'm, I'm up to speed on things. I mean, certainly try filtering whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely. Mm. Well, there goes that app. Um, our minds tend to be, they, they can tend to, to kind of end up like the great Pacific garbage patch. Everybody heard of that? The great Pacific garbage patch. So it is a, uh, this huge, enormous mass of plastic and plastic particles that have gathered in the Pacific that are, it's actually fairly difficult to, de- to, to recognize. You can't just fly over it necessarily and just see this big mass. You'll see areas where plastic that has been, you know, thrown and kind of gathers and collects and it kind of forms, but it, some of it is just underneath the surface of the water. And so there's this huge area that of this great Pacific garbage patch that just collects over time, over a long period of time, from all the currents, and there sense, tends to be like a certain general area that doesn't have the currents flowing through it, so it collects all this garbage over time. And they say conservatively, the size of this patch in the Pacific is the size of Texas. Conservatively, on the small end, probably closer to the size of the United States of America. Of all this trash and plastic particles that have collected and gathered up together. But that's like our minds. All this stuff maybe even almost imperceptible to anybody else, but you've kind of collected and just keep taking in, taking in all these different filters and all this different stuff of what we listen to, of what we watch, what we fill our minds with. And it just starts to kind of collect up in there. And we wonder, man, why am I so worried? Why am I so anxious? Why do I keep thinking these thoughts? Why do I still struggle with lust? Why do I keep doing... And all these different temptations and things, because we've filled our minds with all kinds of stuff, of garbage. And and let me just go straight to a point. One of the problems that I think we have in Christendom is that Christians don't look any different than non-Christians there's often not very much of a distinction between Christians and non-Christians regarding what we watch and what we put into our minds. And I think Paul would have something to say about that. God would have something to say about that. So this isn't a message on like, no longer can you watch any R-rated movies. I don't know what you should be watching or not watching. I have some things I obviously know. But that's between you and the Lord. That's why there isn't some standard of no longer can you watch this. No longer can you listen to that. The standard has got to be God's word and the application of that and how you're going to apply that as the spirit of God speaks to you and empowers you to live out what he has said. Far more difficult than just becoming legalistic and saying, here's the box that you have to live within. That would be far easier for me to be able to just communicate. This is the box. You can watch this and not watch that and listen to this and not listen to that. You're done. But that's not. That's the easy answer. This is far more difficult. No, all these different things I want to apply into my life and consider what does God have? And, and here's what I, what I think this comes to. I believe, and the question is, do you? Do you agree with me? That God has your best in mind. Do you really believe that God has your best in mind when it comes to this? Or are you thinking that God's just a killjoy? 
I don't believe that at all. In fact, I believe that my shepherd, my creator, loves me so much. He's given me so much to think on and to dwell on. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Every time there, you see, whatever, like, it is limitless of all the things that I can fill my mind with, that is God-glorifying, that is excellent and worthy of praise. I want to fill my mind with those things because I really believe that God has his best in mind for me and for you. But it's going to take choices. It will take an empowering of the Spirit of God in your life to apply this. So you're going to be challenged this week, even today with this, of what will you choose? What are you going to fill your mind with? What is it that you're going to dwell on? Are you going to take that thought captive and place it under Christ? Or are you going to fight for joy? Or are you going to choose the path of everybody else that around you? This promise of experiencing the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, is going to take application, choices. So what will you fill your mind with? What will you read? What will you listen to? Let's pray. Father, um, we deal with a lot of anxiety. A lot of things fill our mind. Our minds just tend to run crazy. But God, you are the creator of our minds. You're the one who created us and intricately wove us together. You know everything. And God, if we're going to be killing anxiety and fighting for joy, I pray that we'd be a church that uh, takes this on as as a filter, as uh, taking every thought captive to obey Christ Jesus. And God, in that, that this congregation would experience the joy and the peace that you give. Let us taste and see that you are good. Let us experience, Lord, maybe even for the first time, God, just the the peace that surpasses understanding. God, thank you for your word and for this truth that you've given us. We turn to you, Lord. We turn to you. Where else can we go? In Jesus' name we pray.